Today is Monday, April 8th, and the Mets have their first series win of the year. Let's talk about it. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Shea Station podcast, Monday, April 8th. Jolly Olive here. No Jerry Blevins today. Kind of a solo pod for the first half of the show. Uh, I have a very special member of Braves country joining me in the second half. If you're watching on YouTube, you already know. Uh, But Peter Moylan, who is on the broadcast team for the Atlanta Braves and a good friend of the John Boy Media crew, will be helping me preview the upcoming four-game set at Truist Park in Atlanta. Don't think about that too much yet. It starts tonight, but let's let's enjoy our victories first because the Mets did get their first series win of the year in Cincinnati, playing a pretty good Reds team, a Reds team that was hot entering the series, and the Mets pitching especially uh, was able to cool them off. So we're going to dive into the keynotes here, the series recap and all of that. And uh, at the top of the show, I just want to ask if you guys enjoy Shea Station, consider leaving us a review on podcast apps, or if you're watching on YouTube, uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, all that stuff helps and we'd really appreciate it. Jerry will be back with me on Friday to recap the Braves series. It should be a pretty eventful recap, I might assume. Uh, And we might be able to do it in person because Jerry will be here in New York. So stay tuned for that. That'll be one to look out for. But let's talk about the series that was over the weekend in Cincinnati. The Mets hit the road for the first time and they were able to grab two wins from a decent Reds team. A Reds team with a, a pretty good lineup. And the story of it was pitching. In the first game, Jose Quintana, he allowed that first inning home run to Spencer Steer. And after that, he settled in for five and two thirds innings, one earned run. So uh, a pretty solid outing from him. Still waiting for that uh, first quality start of the year uh, from quality start Quintana. But uh, a big thing here was the bullpen. Uh, we had a full healthy you know, roster here at the back end. All the guys had their rest. Uh, so Smith, Raley, Adovino, and Diaz, they combined for three and a third innings. No earned runs, two hits, two walks, and five strikeouts. It was... um. A bit of a, I want to call it shaky because he did get the job done. But the first time Edwin Diaz looked human, I think, since his return, we saw a wild pitch. Uh, we saw a walk. Uh, so not perfect, but Diaz managed it. We saw the error as well, kicked off his glove. Uh, but he kept his cool, got the strikeout on Jake Fraley at the end. Uh, the offense did just enough here. They kind of squandered some opportunities early in the game. We've been seeing that a lot from this offense. It's getting a little bit tiresome pretty early in the season. Lindor, Alvarez, and Alonzo combined to go 0 for 11 in this game with four strikeouts. Uh, but it was Jeff McNeil, of all people, who provided the power in the eighth inning. Uh, a home run off of Emilio Pagan uh, was the difference in the game because of that ninth inning run off Diaz. So the Mets win this one 3-2 to two on Apple TV, which, you know, I don't know if you're like me, but the Apple TV broadcast is... Uh, ankles are cool, uh, but I prefer my, my GKR in the booth in SNY. Uh, so a bit of a tough watch there, but uh, it helps when the Mets win the game and they won this one three to two. Uh, it can never be easy. You know, we'll talk about an easy win uh, in game three of this series because I think that's probably the easiest game the Mets have played this year. Uh, but a lot to like from this first game. Uh, Quintana managing runners on the base paths is good. Uh, you know, he's a, a finesse pitcher at this point in his career. He's not able to overpower a lot of guys. Uh, four strikeouts and five and two thirds innings is kind of the story there. Um, it's weird because he's the, the heralded ace of the staff right now, but I, I don't think he's been the most impressive pitcher. We'll talk about uh, that in the next game recap. But overall, a nice, solid Mets win. A, a good win to keep the momentum going, get them two in a row, uh, and bring them to a whopping 2-5 and five record. But uh, important to win the first game on the road, always. And um, We'll talk about that more with the Atlanta series preview coming up. Game two, a little bit of a different story. I think the highlight of this game definitely was Luis Severino. If you guys were watching uh, like I was, his fastball looked great. Generated 11 whiffs on that fastball. Got it up to 98 miles per hour and was able to kind of live in the zone against some really good Reds hitters and not get battered around. Um, Again, though, unfortunately, it was kind of defense letting him down. I think Seve could have went six in this game uh, if not for the the light blinding Tyrone Taylor in left field, which led to a double, and then McNeil booting a ball, which led to a run. 
Uh, we saw an uncharacteristic Seve walk with the bases loaded, and then after he got the strikeout in the next at-bat, he let out that ferocious roar, which I think is the first Seve roar we've seen, kind of a signature for him. So I'm excited to see more of that. And for those that follow me on social media, you know that I kind of had an instant reaction uh, during Seve's first start saying, I don't think the experiment's going to work. Um, I'd love to be proven wrong. And I think uh, the Saturday game definitely did. I think it definitely proved me wrong a little bit because Seve looked great. Uh, threw the sweeper when he needed to, got a strikeout on it. It looked good. Um, and more chase pitches. I think that's what I asked for in the last series recap, the last pod episode. I said, uh, let's not live in the zone as much. Let's throw him more in the chase zone. He did both. I mean, he still lived in the zone because that's what Sevy does. But when he's throwing 98, uh, it doesn't really matter. It's tough for hitters to catch up to it, let alone, you know, get a barrel on it. Uh, big offense in this game. Brandon Nimmo finally comes through. Uh, it was a big day for him. A couple knocks. Uh, he got a uh, multi-hit game. He was on base three times. He had the big go-ahead double uh, in the rally in the fourth inning. Shout out to Omar Nervias, who I think we were a little hard on early on. Uh, he clicks three hits in a pretty solid day at the plate. Uh, it was two outs, bases loaded. The Mets had, I think, Bases loaded, one out, and then there was a strikeout, so Narvaez came up in a pretty dire spot. And he came through with a really solid at-bat to tie the game with the two-run single, and then that led to Nimmo's hit. So really nice signs of life from Narvaez. You know, if Alvarez has a DH day, uh, it's nice to know that Narvaez can still kind of swing the bat a little bit back there because the defense hasn't been awesome. Uh, there was a bit of a, a boneheaded miscue in this game for those who were watching. For those who didn't, uh, Omar Narvaez Runners on first and third. Uh, the Reds pull off the Little League double steal. The runner goes to second base. Narvaez throws it. I have to assume he thought he had the runner. There were two outs. If they get the runner at second, the inning ends. Um, but runner beat him by a mile, and the Reds easily score a pretty important run to make it a one-run game. Uh, and that was important because Alonzo and Lindor were quiet at the plate again. Uh, both of them went 0 for 5. They combined to go 0 for 10 on the day. They leave some men on base. And then I mentioned before we had a we had a nice bullpen day the game before, but the combination of Smith, Rayleigh, Adovino, Diaz, they were all two days in a row pitching, so none of those guys were available. You're not going to use guys three days in a row this early in the season. Uh, so it was up to the uh, shorthanded bullpen of Jake Diekman, Johan Ramirez, and Jorge Lopez, who went unused. Uh, Diekman didn't look great, uh, didn't have good command in the strike zone, limited the damage, it could have been worse. And then Johan Ramirez, who's back from suspension, honestly looked good. In his first inning, like he looked solid, but uh, the task for him was to be the multi-inning guy, and it was just uh, <laughs> a cacophony of errors uh, in his second inning. Uh, he got ahead on his first batter, 0-2, walked him, and then there was this weird stolen base. It turned out to be a bulk, so the runner advanced there. We got a strikeout on Jake Fraley on a, a pretty good slider, uh, but the ball gets by. Uh, Fraley reaches base. The runner advances a third, no out recorded. Uh, the infield comes in. Ellie De La Cruz just pokes one right through the hole beyond Beatty and Lindor. There's some miscommunication there, so it just trickles into the outfield, and it was just kind of the inning where everything that could go wrong did go wrong, and it ended with a Spencer Steer three-run homer and then some runs after that for the Reds to take the lead and keep the lead in that game. By the way, Spencer Steer looks like he's going to be a problem in Major League Baseball. That guy looks great. Uh, Twins fans, if for some reason you are listening to this, I got to bring it up. It was brought up in the broadcast. What a trade that was for the Reds a couple years ago. They traded Tyler Molly, who was a, a good starter in his own right, to the Minnesota Twins at the deadline. They got both Christian Encarnacion Strand and Spencer Steer in the deal. It was kind of a deal that reset the Reds lineup completely. And for Molly, I think he made five appearances for the Twins. So one of the more lopsided deals. Uh, and Reds fans, you got to be happy about that. CES didn't look great in the series, but honestly, just by his poise and the way he, you know, how hard he hits the ball, even if it goes foul, uh, I think he's going to be a threat uh, sooner rather than later. But the Mets were able to hold him at bay, which is nice. Uh, but it didn't really matter in game two. I got a little sidetracked there. The Mets did lose game two, nine to six. Um, could have been a winnable game, but at the end of the day, uh, the shorthand bullpen couldn't come through. And it does beg the question of, when are we going to see guys like uh, Shintaro Fujinami, who's starting the year at AAA? He could be a helpful piece. And uh, when are we going to get more length from our Mets starters, which I'm going to discuss with Peter Moylan later on, because as good as the starts have been, we've had one six-inning start, nine games into the season. That is not a recipe for long-term success. Uh, but instead of that looming problem, let's talk about Game 3, which was another victory, as I alluded to before, kind of the... The easiest victory of the season. It was nice to get like a chill 
easy win. And it all started with Francisco Lindor, who finally broke through uh, in his first two at-bats of this game. Uh, he breaks through with a multi-hit day. First three at-bats, I should say. He did have the double play with the bases loaded, which was tough. But two for five, a double and a homer. He snapped an 0 for 23 stretch. His OPS goes from 216 to 403 in one day. That is April baseball for you. The stats just fluctuate. You know, if you have one good day, it kind of fixes everything. So good for Lindor. He gets off the schneid. We need him to be good for this Atlanta series coming up. And shout out to Tyrone Taylor, uh, who had a nice double in this game. He has a multi-hit game. So does Starling Marte. If those guys are contributing at the bottom of the lineup with their speed and their quality contact, uh, the Mets offense has a chance to be a lot better than they have been uh, in the first nine games of the season. But differing from the Tiger series, the Mets were getting guys on base and had opportunities uh, in this series. They just did squander a lot of them, even in this game that they won. They squandered multiple bases loaded one out opportunities in the second and third. They come away with one run in those scenarios, and that could easily be a recipe for disaster or a series loss. But Sean Manaya was up to the task. He looked so good in his Tiger start. He looked just as good in this start. Uh, five innings pitch, one earned run. Three hits, two walks, six strikeouts, no long balls, which is really nice to see. He did load the bases with nobody out in fourth inning. It could have been a complete disaster with an already decently, you know, shorthanded bullpen. If he can't get out of the fourth inning, that's six innings of work, and that's kind of just not there's you're not able to win that game in that scenario. Instead, he limits the damage to a sack fly and gets the double play ball. Brett Beatty, who I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, looked really comfortable on that play. We're going to talk a little bit more about him because what a start to the season Brett Beatty is hat, guys. I mean, if you haven't been watching the games, if you're only looking at box scores, uh, I implore you to watch Brett Beatty play defense this year. It is like night and day from what we've seen from before. That offseason work definitely paid off uh, with Francisco Lindor. And then the bullpen just took care of business in this. It's, it's, it was a nice thing to see. They had two really good games this series. And outside of the Johan Ramirez inning in, in game two, the bullpen was, was really encouraging in this set. And it was a decent test for them, I think, because this Reds lineup is no joke. I think their pitching is more their Achilles heel. That lineup can bang. They can put up eight runs in the blink of an eye. Um, but Jorge Lopez, who's had a great start to the year, and then Rayleigh, Adovino, and Diaz, they combined for four hitless innings in relief for Sean Manaya, just three walks and six punchies. Uh, so they get the job done. They keep them at bay. And the Mets win three to one. So they head out of Cincinnati with a series win. They go up to three and six on the year. Momentum is trending in the right direction. Uh, but there are some overarching notes that I think we, we should hit on uh, as we head into, you know, a, a series preview uh, with the Atlanta Braves. Brandon Nimmo did miss game one with hamstring tightness, but then he played the last two games, which was which was nice to see. He was on base six times six times in his last 13 plate appearances. So I think he's trying to get his momentum back, get back in the swing of things. But Again, I think it was that stolen base attempt in the Detroit series where he stole second, advanced to third, and then they got called back because the umpire was in the way of the arm. Again, just everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So the Mets got uh, the brunt of it there. But every time I see Nimmo attempt a stolen base, it feels like he comes up a little bit lame uh, after it. So hopefully that wasn't the case and it was just kind of a freak thing on defense because I would like Nimmo to at least try if he's going to be batting leadoff every day. Uh, he didn't try in this series, probably just, you know, tending uh, to the tightness there, so probably for the best. Big thing here, um, kind of got swept under the rug because the Mets did win this series. Pete Alonso had a tough series, man. I mean, he made quality contact in a couple at-bats, but 0 for 14, four strikeouts, zero walks. Um, so take from that what you will, but we need Pete Alonso to be going if the Mets are going to have a shot in any of these Braves games. Uh, they did put up 12 runs in three games, so not an amazing pace, but much better than what we saw against uh, Detroit and Milwaukee. And doing that without Alonzo, I think, is an encouraging sign because without him popping the occasional home run or extra base hit, it's going to be hard for the Mets to come by, you know, decent scoring innings. So it was nice to see Lindor pick up the weight in game three, Nimmo pick up the weight in game two, McNeil get a big hit in game one. Like, those guys need to be contributing as well. It can't all be Pete, but you'd like to see more uh, than a goose egg for sure. Uh, one guy who was doing it all series, as I mentioned before, Brett Beatty, just quietly had another great series, 5 for 13, only one strikeout at the plate, and just played stellar defense. Had a game-saving line-out catch, uh, turned a couple really nice double plays that I think last year you wince when you see the ball go his way on those plays. And this year, so far, anytime I see it hit to you know the left side of my screen, I feel pretty good about Brett Beatty making that play. Uh, for those who didn't see on my Twitter, I made a nice compilation of his highlight reel 
uh, just from the first slate of games this season. It's already decently long, at like a minute of just really, really nice, fluid play at third base. So hopefully he can keep that up. And uh, a big series for him coming up, because his first series was at Truist Park in September 2022, where he knocked that huge home run in his first at-bat. Maybe he can recapture some of that magic, because the Mets will need some offense. The Braves are currently the best hitting team in baseball, on pace to be better than they were last season somehow. Um, a key for the Mets securing wins in Atlanta is going to be Edwin Diaz, who I mentioned before, he looked a little human for the first time in game one, but overall in the season, he's just been spectacular. He's been as advertised. He looks like, it looks like he hasn't missed a year of baseball. That's for sure. Uh, on the season, 17 batters faced eight strikeouts, one hit, one walk, no earned runs and two saves. Um, for those who missed it, the friendly, or I guess brotherly competition between him and Alexis is great. Uh, whoever has the most saves at the end of the season has to pay for the entire family dinner. So a nice thing to play for, uh, for Edwin Diaz. We didn't see Alexis this series, I don't believe, unless it was in game two at the end. Uh, but Diaz looks great, looks the part, and the Mets need him to be Edwin Diaz this season if they're going to have a chance to climb out of the early hole that they've set for themselves. But a huge encouraging sign, the Mets pitching has been good. Like, it's not just Edwin Diaz. It's been pretty much the entire rotation. Every guy, I think, has had one at, at least one decent start at this point. So the Mets are the best National League team in ERA at 2.71. They're a top five team in all of baseball, including the American League. Uh, that's through nine games. The second place NL team is the Pittsburgh Pirates at 3.6, almost a, a full run higher than what the Mets have been doing pitching-wise. Um, their starter ERA, rotation-specific, 2.14. It's best in the National League, third best in MLB. Sean Manaya ranks top five in NL for ERA. I know this is a small sample size, two starts, uh, but I think with how poor the lineup has performed, you have to highlight the bright spots, and the pitching has been the only reason we've been able to squeeze out the wins that we have in the first place. Now, I will say this. I am a little bit worried about the length of these starters, and maybe it's a little bit them getting stretched out, um, but so far, they're averaging 5.1, let's just call that five innings per outing, 46.1 innings pitched in nine games, five innings per outing from your starter. It's great when the results are good, but that is a really easy way to tax your bullpen very, very quickly. And, you know, I'm happy with the series win on the road. You're just trying to win two out of three every time. Uh, this could have been a sweep for the Mets had they had a more rested bullpen. You can't really fault Carlos Mendoza. He didn't really have a choice but to use Johan Ramirez for two innings, and it could have worked uh, if a couple you know things kicked the Mets away. Instead, it did not, and it ballooned into this huge inning. But if they get a couple more six-inning starts, you know maybe you save Smith one day, maybe you save Rayleigh one day, and piecing together the bullpen in Game 2 becomes a lot easier. Um and I think a lot of this, you know, attributes to poor defense as well. Poor defense lengthens innings. You know, we saw this in both of Luis Severino's starts. I think he's a guy that can give you six if you play a solid D behind him and don't make him throw, you know, 100 pitches. Uh, so the Mets need to get some length soon because, you know, it's going to get late early with the bullpen. You don't want to tax them early on and lose guys potentially, uh, especially when the bullpen has been so effective when they're rested. Um, so I'm really curious to see if we can get a six-inning start in the Braves series. I'd love at least one. Uh, we've only had one on the season from Sean Nia, and he was literally thrown a no-hitter. Uh, so hopefully uh, that that's something that can come about. Uh, and hopefully the lineup keeps it up, man. You know, 12 runs in four games, I know. It, it doesn't seem like a lot, but watching the games, it's it's a breath of fresh air from the nightmare start this team had in the first six games. Uh, but we need more production out of DH. Uh, DJ Stewart, he started game one. He drew a couple walks, but he is hitless on the season. He's 0 for 10, and... You know, I'm not going to be the guy that comes at the GM 10 games into the season, but I think we're all still a little curious why this wasn't Mark Viento's spot. You know, if J.D. Martinez isn't going to be ready for two, three weeks, he's not going to be in Atlanta, which was my prediction, so I was wrong on that. It could be, you know, the Royal Series or the Pirate Series at home after that. We'll see. But if J.D. Martinez isn't going to be ready for the first 15 or so games of the season, why not give the kid a shot? If Brett Beatty's manning third and doing a really good job at it, uh, that DH spot is open. You don't need Vientos to play third, which is probably the weakest part of his game, defense. Let him swing. I don't know. He's off to a great start at AAA, 10 for 31, which is a 323 batting average, two homers, four walks, and a 981 OPS. 
he's doing what he does. And, you know, if you think he's a quadruple A player, fine, but at least give him a look because as nice as the DJ Stewart story was in August of last year, I do think it's it's run its course a little bit. You know, I'd love to be proven wrong and see DJ have a great series in Atlanta. Um, but his at-bats just have mostly looked uncompetitive. He's looked a little overmatched. And I just think even if Mark Vientos was having those same results, it would have been nice to see him at least get a chance uh, to show what he can do at the plate. Because who knows? Maybe he gets off to a hot start uh, in the first two weeks here and the Mets turn a couple L's into W's because they get a few extra runs on the board. It's all speculation, uh, but it would have been nice is all I'm saying. So it, it's, you know, you can only dwell on it so much before moving on. And the Mets are going to be moving on on this road trip. They have a four game set at Big Bad Trist Park. It's been a nightmare ballpark for the Mets since September of 2022, that fateful sweep at the end of the season. Uh, the Mets have just not been able to crack the Braves since. I don't have their record on hand, but it feels like a million to nothing uh, in, in favor of the Braves in their game since. And I'm hoping that they can at least come away with two wins here. Uh, the pitching matchups, they, they favor the Mets in, in some scenarios, but this Braves team uh, looks like they have not missed a beat early in the season. They lost Sean Murphy on opening day, and it does not matter because this lineup just bangs. They've erased massive deficits in their past series with the Arizona Diamondbacks, the defending National League champions, and they made it look easy. Uh, so the Mets pitching, it's been the best in the National League. We'll see how that fares at the end of this four-game set, which we will recap on Friday. But first, I'm going to have a very special guest join me to help inform us on the Atlanta Braves, how they're doing, and what the mood in the clubhouse is. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Moylan. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so happy to welcome the first guest of the 2024 regular season for the Mets. He is a Mets enemy, though. He did have a 0 0.79 ERA in his career against the Mets. He gets giddy just hearing those numbers. Peter uh, Moylan, a member of the Braves broadcast, a member of the John Boy Media family, is here with me to help preview a big series for both teams. Peter, I just watched your team come back from two massive deficits in back-to-back -back games against the National yeah. League champion. The offense is on pace to be better than it was last year. Uh, what's the feeling in Braves country right now? I bet it's good. It's pretty good after these last three games. Obviously, a sweep of of Arizona was was really nice. Uh, the way they did it was was crazy. Uh, Max doing what he did, Spencer having the the outing that he did, having to come back the way that they did uh, was was pretty special, especially first weekend at home too. You want to build the momentum, and they've done that beautifully. Yeah, I mean, this is a lineup sans Sean Murphy from the first day of the season. It does not look like it matters at all because all they do is bang. Uh, but they are clashing with the team with the best ERA in the National League. So it wow. should be an interesting matchup. Something's got to give here. Uh, the game one matchup, I don't know if you've seen it yet. It is all time. It is Julio Tehran versus Charlie Morton. Tehran making his Mets debut. I pulled this stat just for you because I thought you'd like it. Um Second most innings in Truist Park history. Julio Tehran at 282. Third place, Charlie Morton, 266. Do you know who number wow. one is? I should know. Hold on. Uh, it's going to be so obvious when you it's say obvious, it. Yeah. Max Free? Yeah, it's Max Free. Nicely done. Thank you. And we'll see you no, later. I'm so series. glad I got that. I should have been <laughs> kicked off the podcast if I didn't get that question. Right. I think so. We probably would have just cut it short. It might have just scrubbed Thank it you. from the entire episode. Um, <laughs> so I haven't watched Charlie Morton pitch yet this year. I watched him pitch against the Mets a lot last year. He looked great. Yeah. Uh, what have you seen so far uh, from the guy who seems like his career is just never going to end? He's, he was just as brilliant as he has been all last year. In fact, he might have been the best of of all of the starters uh, first go around. Uh, his curveball is just something that, to behold. He yeah. just keeps throwing it, and he's able to locate it, and he's able to find it. And even if he hasn't got it for a period of time, he'll just go to something else. He'll he'll mix in a cutter just to mess with his guys, to steal strikes. Um, his fastball velo is still sitting at 95, 96 That's when he incredible. needs it. It really is. He's like, 40, he, he just Peter. Keeps, He's 40. What's that? He's 40 years old. And he just keeps getting 20 million bucks to come back and do exactly what he does uh. every year. But uh, you, what people understand, they see him in interviews and he's so, he's so thinks every answer out and he's, but he's just such a lovable guy. It's, it's not even just that he's such a good person. He's just, he's such a lovable person. And, and it's, I couldn't be happier for him, but, 
he's uh he's never going to stop yeah um and it, you can the craziest thing is that you just tell him that it, it's coming he's going to throw it at 47 percent of the time whatever it is and it, it, no one can make the adjustment to it yeah i mean he's a new jersey native so he's got that you know tugging at my heartstrings a little bit but his you know the back of his career you know it's just you incredible. will find anything to grab onto won't oh you? yeah absolutely yeah uh, right. Last year, quietly, so quietly, 30 starts, 122 ERA plus. Like That at 39 years old is so impressive. So the Mets will get a, a nice dose of him in game one. Uh, game two, I'm really curious to get your thoughts on this Brave starter because this is kind of a just a quiet, interesting story for their season. Uh, the matchup is Adrian Hauser and Reynaldo Lopez. I watched Hauser pitch a couple of days ago. He looked good. Uh, five innings pitch, one earned run. They pulled him, you know, once he got a sniff of trouble in the six. I thought that was the right move. It's kind of what you have to do with him. On the other side, the Braves are experimenting kind of with Reynaldo mm-hmm. Lopez. They've tr- Teams have tried to make him a starter before. He hasn't been a full-time starter since 21. He was yeah. lights out in the bullpen for the Braves last year. Him and Reisel were a really nice combination. Uh, now he's starting games again. He got his first start against the White Sox, his former team, and you know he dealt them a heavy dose of what he's capable of. Hold on. What have you he seen? He wasn't so with far? us last year. He wasn't. He wasn't with us last year. <gasps> Peter. All right. Well, let's see. Just before Do I have to get back, kicked I, off the I, podcast now? I didn't want you to get it. Oh, you to you're right. Excuse me. Well, he could have been a nice combination. He would have been. In, he was nasty in, in whoever's. But was he with the Angels? Who he was, was he with was three. Year? Yes, he was one of these three different teams, guys. You know, I should have known because yeah. there's the thing where he goes wherever Lucas Giolito goes, and they finally <laughs> broke that this year. So Braves would have made sense. So apologies for that, Peter. Uh, let me ask you, what did you see in yeah. that first start uh, that's got you encouraged or discouraged about him? Uh, look, here's the thing. I didn't get to see anything during spring training. Uh, I watched his last start, and it, it honestly impressed me. Uh, I didn't know that the velo was going to be able to hold like it did throughout the five, six innings that he got through. He was up to 96 by the end of that game as well. I'd, all the talk I'd ever heard was, well, they tried this before. You know, sure, maybe it was part of the the signing deal that that they said a handshake deal will let you try to be a starter, but in the back of their minds, they were just going to throw him in the bullpen. Mm. But our bullpen just went 13.1 innings of scoreless baseball against the Diamondbacks as wow. well. So um, that's a bullpen that, that picked up Braves legend Jesse Chavez right before the start of the season and he threw three innings of of masterful baseball for us as well so experiment yes then you look at the Spencer Strider news uh, and then you think that it may not be an experiment for too much longer he may be a staple uh, and especially if he keeps doing what he did against the White Sox. Uh, You mentioned Jesse Chavez I I can't believe the the odyssey is continuing. Five innings pitch, mm-hmm. one earned run. Like he's just doing what he does, man, every year. I spoke to him uh, two days ago, and uh, I was like, listen, man, I thought I had a pretty good run coming back <laughs> to this team, but you've come back for the fifth time, and you're still managing to get people out. I don't know how you do it. Just buy a house in Atlanta and be done with it. Cut out the middleman. Do not sign for the team in spring training. Just spend time with your family, sit at home, and then when May rolls around or April rolls around and they're looking for pitching, you can just rise up, throw the hat on, and away you go. Three shutout innings, he'll be back. It is something about the uniform. And double gut punch to the White Sox here. They were the team that cut him in spring training. I'm sure they could use a Jesse Chavez in the bullpen right now. Um, uh, dude, he was great last year, too. I didn't even realize how good he yeah. was. 1.56. He, got hurt, six man. he got hurt right at the start of the season. He was lights oh. out and then <laughs> got a ball off his shin and just kind of never really had a chance to come back from it. Yeah, still the numbers on the season were great. Uh, so I'm mm. curious to see him in this series. I'm sure we will. Uh, but I think both these teams kind of need length from their starters. Like you mentioned, bullpen just got used a lot in your series. Um, but that was a crazy thing, though. The way yeah. that they were able to use the bullpen this last series, it seems like they threw a lot. 13.1 innings is a lot for a bullpen. But every guy, like Dylan Lee went multiple. AJ right. Minter went multiple. We had Jesse go multiple. We had Tyler Matzik thrown. Everybody contributed. It was 20 minus the two starters that didn't get to touch the ball. Legitimately, 24 other people had an impact on that series. So it wasn't like it was a couple of guys that stood up as heroes. It was everyone. It was crazy. And yeah. we haven't got a lot of the guys firing yet. Olsen and Riley had pretty good series, but Acuna hasn't done anything yet. Yeah, and I mean, that's kind of a, a new kick with a lot of rosters this year is finding those multi-inning relievers. Um, as good as the Mets pitching has been, I mentioned it before you came on, uh, mm. we've only had one six-inning start. So the bullpen's been going a lot, and we don't, we don't really have these two-inning guys. Everyone looks really good in their one inning. Uh, the Mets attempted to use Johan Ramirez for two, and that's how their their middle game of the Red Series blew up completely. 
Um, so they're going to need length out of their starters because I don't think they have that uh, in their arsenal, at least not right now. Um, so Hauser versus Lopez will be an interesting game here. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let you go on uh, game three for sure, because this is an interesting scenario. This would have been Spencer Strider's spot. He's currently okay. shelved. We don't know quite yet what the result is going to be, but I think a lot of the feeling is probably Tommy John with his UCL issue. Uh, it's Jose right. Quintana versus I assume Bryce Elder. It could be somebody else, but uh, I think that's probably, you know, besides the Murphy injury, the oblique on opening day, that's probably the only dark cloud looming over the Braves right now. So what's the feeling with uh, the Spencer Schreider news? Well, it's obviously massive. You can't replace him. And yeah. that's, uh, that's the biggest thing is, is no matter what you try to replace him with, it's not going to be a Spencer Strider. So um, there is, there's one thing that the Braves do really well. Alice Anthopoulos holds his cards to his chest better than anybody. Like he will, People find out about roster moves literally the day they happen. Right. And it's 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 a team that that and even trades you don't hear about his trades ever. He, he's just got it's it's like Fort Knox up there. So <laughs> I, I think it could be Elder. I think it could be Enoa. I think it could be Winans who got called up yesterday to mm. add some length to that pen that was obviously drawn out. But uh, um, I just. Uh, the Strider injury was was massive, and it's massive. It's just another one of these injuries that we've heard from in Major League Baseball, arm injuries, and you know, there's so many theories behind it, and and it's just it's frustrating to hear everybody think that they have the the one answer, but it's a combination of everything. It's it's so many different things, and and this is a kid, and this is a guy who's literally spent his whole life figuring it out how to avoid injuries right. with his mechanics. He went through Tommy John in college when he was at Clemson. He broke himself down and figured out what it's going to take to get himself to the best physical shape that he can be. You've seen the size of his legs. He works more than anyone you've ever seen. He researches more than anyone you've ever seen. So it's going to be interesting to see you know, what happens. I don't know what is going to happen. We still don't privy to that. Um, I've seen a couple of guys go off for second opinions and not have Tommy John. Mm. Um, so there are other... Uh, surgeries and scenarios that are, that are creeping in these days. Uh, back a couple of years ago, it was legitimately well. We'll see you in twelve months. So yeah. um, there there are some questions, but look, the offense, the bullpen, and the other four guys surrounding Spencer, uh, I think we'll be able to pick up the slack until we figure out a solution. Yeah, I mean, this Braves team is too talented to, I think, falter from one player, but it is, it's emblematic of a larger problem. And the mm -hmm. list of names that are on the shelf from elbow and arm injuries right now is, it's staggering between DeGrom and, and Otani, Alcantara. So it's the, and it's the, but it's also, it's not just old guys, it's also younger guys as right. well. So that's where I feel like it's not just one problem. Um, there's guys that have been, have their have had their ways to get themselves ready for for a season for years and years and, and they're getting hurt now as well so it, there's a lot of things there's there's the there's the baseballs there's the weighted balls there's the how much off-season work a guy's doing there's so much emphasis on on lifting and strength and and i i don't know the answer I, I really don't. I had two Tommy Johns. I had a shoulder. Like, it's not. I'm not like I'm sitting here going, well, back when I was there, I was right. able to get through flawless. No, I was one of the most injured guys to play this game. So uh, this is nothing new for me. Uh, it just seems like the numbers are uh, higher than, than I remember in years past. Yeah, and I don't really know a solution either as the, the chase for velocity kind of continues. And I think and that's, Strider's yeah, mechanics and is velocity. just... It's, it, I, th I liked what you said before about how he kind of built himself up to avoid this kind of thing. Cause he did a very, mm. you know, he had a fluid motion. I, I think he was not so much an innings eater, but he was very durable. And this kind of just felt like it came out of nowhere, out of thin air. And a lot of attention is going to be put on, you know, the, the labs drive yeah. line, these sorts of places. Um, but I don't think they're to blame. You can also switch it the other way where if a guy says, okay, look, I need to, I need to get better. I'm a fastball slider guy. I need to develop a third pitch, whatever that happens to be. And you yeah. go to one of these places. If you don't have that place, the only way you can find a new pitch is by continuing to throw that pitch and getting a feel for it. You go to a lab, you can figure out how to get that pitch pretty quickly and pretty, pretty efficiently. So yeah. you're cutting down on the amount of time you need to spend throwing in order to develop that new pitch. So it's, there's an argument for each side of this that I can, I can lean on, 
So I just think that, you know, we need to find a solution, obviously, but it doesn't need to be, well, you, you, you're you wrong and you're wrong. We can come together and say, let's figure this shit out because it needs to, yep. it needs to be figured out. No, it definitely does. And hopefully that's the extent of the Braves injuries to their rotation because, I mean, yeah. this is, while a talented rotation, there are looming questions. You know, Max Fried missed a lot of time last year. Chris Sale has had just an injury history of the past five years, essentially, but he looks great early on. The Mets won't see him this series. And then Reynaldo Lopez, who's being stretched out at this point. So the Braves will need to rely on their depth, but their depth is pretty good. Uh, their depth is yeah. a guy who was an all-star last year and ended up in AAA somehow uh, in Bryce Elder. So if it is him on uh, what would be Wednesday's game, I'm curious to see how he fares. Um, he's done pretty well against the Mets the past couple of years, so we'll see. And, uh, you know, same thing here. Quintana has yet to finish six innings and a start. So we're, we're going right. to need some length as well. But how much length do you get? How dangerous can it be? That's going to be kind of a, a continuous discussion, I guess. Uh, Lindor getting a couple of knocks for you guys yesterday has to be a nice relief uh, as a Mets fan. I have and no as a idea. Mets, uh, is, it just the, is it just the lineup not clicking early on? I mean, the pitching's been great. Um you know, quietly, last series, Alonzo was hitless. He went 0 for 14. And then I think every game was nice because it was McNeil in the first game hitting the homer. Nimmo had a nice game in game two. And then Lindor finally got off the schneid in game three. If all three of those guys go, plus Beatty's been playing great, and then Alonzo starts hitting again, now you have a cohesive lineup. But it's just been through the first nine games, no one's clicking at the same time. And they've really had to scrap for runs. They've blown a lot of opportunities. Um, so I'm hoping... This will be an offensive series because I, I would like mm. to see length from the starters, even if it means they get hit around more. And at the same time, I want the, our offense to at least try and keep up uh, with how the Braves are going to hit because you know they're going to put up at least four or five a game. There's going to be there's going to be a big emphasis tonight too. We got the anniversary of Henry Aaron's 715 wow. home run tonight at Truist. Place is going to be packed. First Mets Braves of the year, and First Julio Tehran, the, the return of the king. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> I want, oh man there's going to be tribute videos it's going to be great oh, yeah. what do you have like seven years on a bros uniform it's probably he had so a lot. weird he was he, was, the he was there through the tough times too yeah. he was the guy that him and freddie were just kind of the guys that just powered through those those 90 lost seasons and he had a, he had a couple of nice years with the braves yeah um, it's crazy he I was him, on i was i remember him as a prospect coming up he yeah. was when he was 16 i remember hearing about this kid coming and, and man he was electric He's got that sinker ball going. It's a, it's been a nice comeback for him. He, he didn't have a full season since 2019, and then he briefly emerged last year with Stearns' Brewers. I guess Stearns liked what he saw, brought him back this year. So we'll see how it goes in a Mets Uni. Uh, we got one more game to preview here. I'm excited for this one. I think this will probably be the best pitching matchup we had, although you know, both these guys have had kind of weird starts to the year. Uh, Luis Severino and Max Fried go head-to-head -head in the final game, which will be the afternoon game on Thursday. Uh, yeah. Fried. Five cool. innings pitched, 10 earned runs so far in yeah. the year. What's been going on? A couple tough first innings for him. So you saw the Philly stuff, obviously. That yeah. was that was one that the was replayed called a lot. strike three, which wasn't called, and that ballooned into another thing. But Yeah, and then, look, yesterday it was just – I actually said that my key before the game was to him just to get out of that first inning cleanly, yeah. and then you saw what happened. It was a really, really rough first inning, and I think – the broadcast mentioned it. I was thinking that he was maybe one hitter away from getting pulled out of that game again yeah. yesterday, which would have been devastating mentally, I, I, I would think. Um, you know, you look at how a guy bounces back from a tough outing and then you have two of them like that. He figured something out, two, three, four, um, punched out the side in the second inning. So something was off. His pitches weren't moving the way you're expecting them to move. His right. sinker was cutting. His changeup was staying up and flat. His slider was flat. And it just wasn't the normal Max Freed. But he did figure something out. He went back out for the fifth. A couple of fielding errors that you don't see from him. Mm. So that's something that he'll want to he'll want to clean up. But I think I think he'll be locked in. 12-20 game on a Thursday getaway day. Look for about a 2-20, two-hour and 20-minute game with a 2 nothing Bravos win for that one. I think. Oh, wow. You're predicting early on? <laughs> Let's get your bets in, guys. Jeez. <laughs> Uh, yeah, six run first inning against the Diamondbacks there. He ends up going into the fifth inning and throws 97 pitches. So I think that you can take away and be kind of encouraged by. Um, sure. But uh, it's interesting because the Mets have been the worst first inning offense since the beginning of last season. And Max Fried so far surrendered nine of his 10 runs in the first inning. So something's got to yeah. give, Peter. Something will happen here. Um, 
Biggest takeaway, Mets-wise, offensively, Pete Alonso, 294 average, 885 OPS against Freed in his career. That's been a fun matchup to watch pretty yeah. much since Pete first came up. But four really interesting matchups, the way this series is lined up. Um, I think the best case scenario for the Mets is you try and split this one, but I think Truist has kind of just been a nightmare scenario for them ever since September of 22. And for the Braves, it's kind of, you know, keep the momentum rolling. You know, you just swept yeah. the defending champs. Uh, it looks like the Strider injury hasn't slowed them down a bit. And, uh, you know, just keep the, the Braves machine rolling. I think that's all exactly what, what they were looking to do. They want to get some consistency out of their starters uh, in this series, I'm sure. Uh, have the lineup click. Jared Kellenick has been yeah. absolutely incredible first for us. First half versus the Mets, I think, right? I don't think he What's saw that? us. I think is the Mariners. The first time versus him? Yeah, the Mariners came to City Field, but I think he was either hurt or demoted. So I don't think he's ever hit against us. Wow, no that's gonna be that's gonna be big. So, yeah, look, he's just he's uh, it just he looks like a more relaxed. He's having a good time. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I, I get to see them uh, during BP and warm ups and, and it, it's just the whole vibe around the team. It's very relaxed. It's very, uh, professional. And it's just, it's, it's a Battlestar Galactica, man. It's just a well-oiled machine that, that just moves. It's great. Yeah. And for the Mets, they're under new leadership yet again, they kind of need to mm -hmm. find that footing getting their first series. win, I think definitely helps. It looks like the, the team is in good spirits, but just, a nightmare first week of the season. Hopefully they can let that roll off their backs like water off of a duck. But Peter, thank yes. you so much for joining Shea Station, bro. I appreciate you. Buddy. Thank you for helping me preview. Uh, hopefully at the end of this week, at least one of us is very happy. And I think that'll probably be the case. I'm sure we're both going to be extremely happy because Same. we're just happy people. Yeah, we, we, can, we can set aside our baseball love and we can just be anything. happy that we're here. I will see you probably at the warehouse sometime soon. Jerry sends his regards. Thank you, bro. Appreciate tell, it. Tell Jerry I love him. See you. All right, guys, and that'll do it for today's episode of Shea Station. Really appreciate you tuning in. If you liked this format of the solo show and a guest coming on to preview the series, there's going to be more of it during the season. As much as I love Jerry, you know, uh, schedules conflict and all that, so hopefully we can get him on once a week. He'll be on for the uh, Braves recap show on either Thursday night, I'm assuming Friday morning will probably be the case, but we appreciate you. If you enjoyed the episode, consider leaving us a review, consider subscribing to the YouTube channel, ringing the bell, all that good stuff. It helps us out. We're trying to reach as many Mets fans as possible and trying to spin 2024 into a very positive result. So we'll see you guys at the end of the week. Let's go Mets and listen to this sweet outro music.